Okay, let's start with a couple of questions. How come that the diamond is really, really hard and really, really strong and graphite Wait, can you hear is really us? soft? Uh, now I can hear you, yes. Okay, so we'll just have to speak louder because you couldn't actually hear us. So we do have students raising their hands, so. Okay, I see. Then uh, go ahead. Um, the structure of how the atoms align in those. Uh, so diamonds uh, is so hard because of the special like, crystal alignment of the atoms inside it. So and graphite is softer because of the opposite yeah that's a very good answer and in fact it's such a good answer that probably i need to cut half of my slides because you seem to be knowing all of these things yes really the answer is not lying in chemistry as in not elemental chemistry but in terms of how do you arrange those elements you make your material from both of these are made out of carbon yes but they are connected differently so you see that the diamonds on the left uh, is made out of carbon. Uh, and then the carbon there, are, each of the carbon atoms are connected to four neighbors of the carbons. This makes very strong bonds. This makes a very nice rigid structure. Uh, and the structure has you know, four saturated bonds per carbon. That's why this is a non-conductive material and it's transparent. Graphite, on the other hand, is again made out of carbon. But then there, each carbon atom has only three neighbors. Now, this means that the chemistry here is different. Uh, these atoms are connected with the sp2 hybridized orbitals. Uh, there is a lot of aromatics going on. The, the hexagons that the carbons make, they're flat, which means that electrons can travel quite nicely through them. That's why this material is conductive and shiny. And also on top of that, uh, these layers are stacked together, but they're stacked very, very weak fashion. So there are no... Uh, no strong covalent bond in two layers. Uh, and then Weyerweil's bonds are significantly weaker. That's why uh, the material is so weak up to the point you can even peel them, uh, the uh, individual layers, which are called graphite layers, layer by layer. If you, for instance, put the scotch tape on that and then start peeling it up. Great, okay. Then uh, I have another question. I don't expect really the answer, uh, but I'm going to be very, very happy if you give me one. How do antibiotics work? How do what? Antibiotics work. Um, they destroy the structure of uh, the, so the bacteria, the, basically the pathogen have the, uh, this like film around them, like, uh, like uh, like a protection layer and antibiotics like attach themselves to that layer and literally pull the like the pathogen apart and therefore it cannot function without its like I don't know how to say it in English but there is like a oh, like the okay. outer layer of it and then they pull it apart basically. Maybe you want to say something? No, 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 no. Well, that's very good. Yes, uh, that's one way. Uh, unfortunately, it's, the, not, it's not exactly the one I've prepared on the slide. So if you can come up with another way of how antibiotics might work, like you're going to get an extra point. Ah. Well, they can attack from the protein production of the bacteria. Uh -huh. How would they do that? Well, they, uh, if the antibiotics go through the cell membrane, then they can do that. Or they can uh, have a leak okay. the There is a lot of different ways. Uh, well, thank you very much, because that's the <laughs> one of the examples I have prepared. So reality is there are lots and lots and lots of antibiotics, and there are multiple ways how they work. And some of them, they target very specific proteins, which do you know, certain things in the cell and then stop the cell producing. And one of those is to make in the shell of the cell so that the cell can uh, survive in the harsh environments uh, and sustain the uh, pressure. So, before I continue, there is one some Zoom who is speaking. Can you mute that person, please? <laughs> because that's not the audience room, it's something else. 
Thank you very much. So one of the big proteins you can attack uh, is called a ribosome. Ribosome is a huge machine which does a very, very important function uh, in cells that produces other proteins. Uh, and then, uh, in fact, a lot of antibiotics attacking uh, the ribosome of bacteria uh, by uh, their very, very small molecule compared to the size of the ribosome, but their molecule is such that uh, it goes into the ribosome and very specifically binds to a particular place and stops the ribosome to work properly. So in principle, there are a couple of ways how this can be done. Uh, one of the ways is presented over here. Um, so there is uh, one of the channels uh, through which the transport RNA are passing through the ribosome uh, and then uh, the particular antibiotics like uh, adenine or uh, streptomycin, uh, they would be going there and very, very specifically binding to one of these sites uh, and then blocking either the transport RNA going through the cell or uh, docking for the start codon of the protein. Uh, the reality is uh, that uh, there is quite a big battle uh, in terms of the producing of new antibiotics because uh, also bacteria are not as stupid. Uh, the ribosome is a very important, very complex machinery. And obviously the ribosome from uh, bacteria and from humans are different. But unfortunately, bacteria are quite fast uh, at mutating. So they, would, they can figure out some of the differences between human ribosome and bacterial ribosome and then turn those you know, little make little tweaks to the ribosome such that uh, their bacterial ribosome can look more like human ribosome. And obviously we can't just block production of all the proteins in the human body, that this way we're gonna kill the person. So uh, one of the ways how people are gonna be improving uh, new antibiotics is trying to make mo molecules even bigger than they currently are and even more specific, such that they would only bind to the bacterial ribosomes and gonna not be affecting the human ribosomes at all. And again, all of this can be done only because we know exactly how the ribosome is made, what, it, what are the units it's made out of, and uh, almost up to an atom, we know where everything sits so that we can get a very good idea of how to tune uh, the shape of the uh, uh, antibiotic molecule uh, to block that. Now comes the main question of this talk. How do we actually know where are the atoms in all of these materials? How did scientists figure where are those atoms? And uh, because these pictures look nice uh, and it looks like there's some certainty with which we say that yes, indeed atoms are where we think they are. How do we do it? Do you have an idea? Crystallography. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great answer. And how would that work? Any other methods you know? Uh, no. NMR. NMR, yes, exactly. And uh, that's uh, the second uh, beloved method for all the chemists. Whenever they synthesize a new molecule, they want to check it, they're gonna do the NMR and that's what works there. Do you know any other methods which would work? The title of this talk is um, seeing atoms without lenses. So that can be a hint for another method. <laughs> yeah. So what kind of microscope is there on? So the answer is for light and electron microscopes. Electron microscope is definitely an answer. And in fact, it's a huge growing field. Uh, you might have heard of cryo-AM that's steaming up, uh, especially in the field of uh, protein uh, analysis of the structures. But weirdly enough, even though those don't have any crystals, crystallographers are doing that as well, <laughs> strangely. Uh, yes, okay, for the light microscope, I'll come back in a second, uh, uh, if that's gonna work at all. Do you know any other methods how we could figure out what's, what a molecule that we have is, what are the atoms, how they're connected to each other? Mass spectrometry, for example. Yes, mass spectrometry is a good answer. So by itself it doesn't work very well because it gives you the mass of the molecule you're looking at but there are some nice tricks in the mass spectrometry 
where you can crush molecules uh, with something. So you can tear them apart and see what are the pieces they're made out of. And then this piece is going to tell you quite exactly what uh, and how is the connectivity of the molecule. Yes, that's very, very good. Anything else, do you know? I don't know if spectral photometry is the same thing as mass spectrometry. Maybe not. So spectral photometry also. Yes, uh, that's also a method. Uh, it works a little bit less precisely, I should say. Uh, that's the one where you know a set of molecules you need to choose from. Uh, but if you're looking for something specific in some, I don't know, food, and this is a very good, fast and cheap method for checking what's there. Yes. Yes, yes, all of these work. Uh, but today I'm going to be talking about uh, the crystallography. And now since one of you mentioned uh, the microscopes, uh, we'll try to start with this. Well, if you want to make a microscope which sees the atoms, there is a question, which light do we need to use? Visible. <laughs> Visible. Yes, uh, we usually use visible light in light microscopes, but if you've gone to the microscopes and you've seen what are the magnifications, the biggest magnification you can go to is such that you see uh, the features of roughly a micron size, maybe like a little bit less than a micron. And then there are a couple of tweaks uh, they're gonna do to get you a little bit less than that. But that's about it. So you're gonna see, uh, well, some of the microorganisms, bacteria in microscope. But unfortunately, you can't go much deeper than that. You can't even get to the portions of bacteria, how they look like. And there is a very good physical reason. There is a very hard limit uh, why we can't go further than that with using the visible light. And that's to do with the wavelength of the visible light. You see, uh, you know, light or kind of electromagnetic radiation for that sake comes a whole range of different frequencies. Uh, it starts from the radio, which is electromagnetic wave, quite obviously. There's microwave, infrared, visible light. And the reason they are different is because uh, the light has different wavelength. So they're quite long for the wavelength, roughly, you know, on the amount of meters or kilometers. Uh, microwave wavelength, something, uh, the frequency at which the Wi-Fi of your uh, computer is going to be working, going to be somewhere centimeter, millimeter range. Uh, then there comes the infrared light. Visible light is such that it has the length of roughly a micron. Uh, then if you go to a shorter wavelength, you're gonna get to harder radiation. So ultraviolet is short, shorter than that. And then uh, come the X-rays and then come the gamma rays. The wavelength, this length between the two maxima of the period of the light is what defines the resolution you can get to. And unfortunately, with visible light, that's one micron. Atoms are smaller than one micron. In fact, they're uh, so small that we even have a special unit for them. They're uh, of the size of an angstrom. This is 0 0.1 nanometer. So they're gonna be a thousand times, well, 10,000 times smaller than light can see. Uh, so unfortunately, the visible light doesn't gonna work there we need to use X-ray light instead in order to be able to try to see the molecule. But now if you start imagining how this whole setup for trying to imagine a single individual molecule would look like, there are a couple of interesting things to note. Okay, so we're building our microscope and we're gonna be looking at one side and then uh, they're gonna be a table. We're gonna put our molecule on. Say we want to understand what that molecule is. Any guess what that molecule is? Some people have learned it by heart. That's caffeine. But, uh, just maybe I'm spoiled. There are too many hipster places here that draw it on the blackboard. Uh, anyways, we have our microscope. You're gonna be looking roughly like microscope uh, that we normally have, except for the lights, we're gonna be using X-rays. Now, do you think this is gonna work? I realize I started asking too many rhetoric questions. I think I'll carry on. If you have something, uh, go shout. Well, for the scheme that I've just shown to you, there is one problem, and you probably all know about this. 
And the problem is uh, this, you see it in the picture on the left. X-rays are very, very hard rays. They are quite energetic. They go through material and interact with the material very little. Uh, in fact, you know this fact very well because X-rays in comparison to the normal lights, they can quite nicely penetrate through your body. And that's what you use when you're making the x-rays in the in hospital. Now the problem comes because uh, the x-rays, they're quite nice and they can easily go through a couple of centimeters of your tissue without even experiencing much of the absorption. And there, as you see here, uh, and that's a couple of centimeters of material. Atoms we're going to be uh, investigating are much smaller than this. In fact, I've uh, drawn here, so the thickness of the hand is going to be, you know, one to two centimeters. So we're talking about X-rays quite nicely penetrating through, you know, two to the ten to the minus two meters. And the thing we want to Im image with this is uh, an atom, and the size of the atom is, as I told you, one extra, which is ten to the ten of meters. And this is a problem because, at that stage there isn't going to be much interaction. To put it kind of in a more manageable, understandable perspective, I've prepared like this comparison. So if this is, uh, if we will increase everything and make an atom bigger, such that is say uh, the size uh, of the uh, bus uh, baseball, uh, then uh, in comparison, the thickness that the X-rays can penetrate is going to be on the level of the size of the earth. So we're looking for baseball with a light which very nicely passes through earth. The problem here comes from the fact that we need to provide enough of the x-rays shining on our material in order, in order to get uh, some interaction with this material to the x-rays so that we can collect some of the data and then to you know, be able to see something on the other side. And you see that, you know, in a simple direct way of taking just a single individual molecule and putting it there, it doesn't quite work. So we'll need to do something slightly better than this. Well, what we can always do is we can take multiple molecules. Uh, if we, you know, take one and then put another one, put another one, put another one, and very nicely make a stick out of those. Then it's gonna increase our contrast. You know, there are you know, a dozen molecules over here that the contrast is gonna be 10 times more. Uh, it's great, we need uh, 10 orders of magnitude more, but that's our starting point. But if we try to make this setup uh, in exactly the same thing, the same way as the, how the normal microscopes work, where you take your sample, which is going to be in a stack of your molecules, and you shine the x-rays through, and then you're trying to make the image of some sort of lens on the other side, uh, you need to make sure that you have you know, big enough stack, you know, some sort of a millimeter size stack of molecules uh, pointing in some direction. Uh, and uh, they should be aligned so very well uh, that uh, they are aligned up to the, uh, up to individual atoms. This is very, very, very precise. And to be fair, we can't get to that precision even with our best techniques. And our best techniques are very, very good because we know how to do uh, semiconductors at a uh, certain you know, 10, 10 nanometer length scale of the features. There is a second problem, which you might not be aware of, but uh, X-rays are really, really hard to work with in terms of making optics, since they penetrate everything and they don't have you know, a lot of refraction. If you want to make a single lens, which somewhat focuses X-rays, it needs to be big. In a sense, I mean, you need to make lots and lots and lots of little lenses in order for them you know, collectively to work one way or the other. And here is uh, the stack of lenses uh, made out of uh, some metal and then with the cylindrical holes drilled in them. So that works, but the uh, quality of the light that you're gonna get on the, and in the end of it is, is, is terrible. So reality is the way by just trying to build an individual microscope, uh, trying to use X-rays as our primary source just doesn't work, it all falls apart. But the beauty is uh, this problem was solved. And in fact, it was solved way before we came to uh, the very powerful electron microscopes uh, or uh, the technique uh, so that we can make you know, beautiful X-ray optics uh, uh, 
better than, than what I've shown is here. And this is uh, what I'm trying to tell you. And the trick here comes from the fact that we're not going to be using lenses at all. In fact, we're going to be using a lensless technique uh, to investigate what's inside there. So this is going to be a microscope where you have just the light coming in. So you'll have your molecule, for instance, here, and there are going to be lights coming in. And then without any lenses, we'll just put detector around the molecule and see what we can see in there, how we can judge of what uh, the structure is going to be. So the way that scheme works is you have your primary light, it comes in, then it gets to some of the molecules. The molecule is going to be scatters. Uh, for instance, if we use X-rays, molecules contain a lot of electrons around them. All the electrons interact very strongly with X-rays and they're going to scatter X-rays all around them. And then as the primary beam goes through, they're going to be secondary beams generated by each of the individual scatters, each of the individual atoms, and then they proceed uh, in order to be combined together. Now, this, again, hypothetical example where you have just a single very sharp electromagnetic pulse which comes into your sample as non-realistic. We don't have a very good idea of how to make such very, very sharp, very, very strong pulses. What we do instead is we have uh, long, continuous uh, uh, primary sources which provide us with very good monochromatic radiation. And monochromatic radiation uh, means that uh, we're going to be, well, our radiation is wave and monochromatic is that this is a wave with a particular wavelength. So uh, normally what it does is the primary beam can be looking like a wave, uh, something like a sinusoidal wave, which comes from the left here. And then if there are scatterers somewhere around there, you will see that there is a very, very weak interaction. And then they produce the secondary wave as the primary wave goes through. So I'll try to remove the primary wave and you'll see that the scattering from these materials are going to appear. And here is uh, the uh, signature. So you see now only the wave which is scattered from uh, you know, these three atoms in a hypothetical molecule, uh, and then all the primary beam is removed. Now, the reason we can still use this scheme in order to image things is, uh, is, is hidden in the fact that the waves, after they scatter from these uh, atoms, they still interact with each other. So you see, I'll start this as a video. When the primary beam comes in, it excites the secondary waves. And since the secondary waves are waves uh, in their nature, then whenever they propagate, whenever they sum uh, together, they're going to be summing differently, depending on whether the waves are going to be coming you know, together in a phase from multiple crystals or uh, out of phase for some other crystals. So for instance, here uh, in this direction, there is a lot of waves which are interfering and what's called a coherent uh, or uh, constructively. Uh, and uh, for instance, in this direction over here, you see there is a bright gray line where the waves are interfering destructively. So uh, in principle, if we then now put a set of detectors all around our molecule, we'll be able to see that in certain directions, there is more light coming in and in certain directions, there is less light coming in. And in fact, if we had a very, very good detector such that they could uh, record correctly, uh, not only the amplitude of the wave, which goes in a certain direction, but also the phase with which it comes. And by phase here, I mean, I'll show how the phase works in just another slide. Then there is a simple mathematical technique where we can use what's around there. We'll need to use a computer, of course, uh, but this will uh, allow us to reconstruct what the uh, distribution of the original scatters was. And like for very, very simple technique, we can tell you, so you see there are three atoms plus a little bit of noise in between. And the way that works in this ideal scenario where you have a very, very good detector is uh, you basically, you know, put the detector all around your sample and collect all of the waves which come in there. And then artificially in the computer, you turn them around. So you say that, you know, those waves, they're coming from the sphere inside and then you can uh, you sum them together with the amplitudes that they were going outside and with the phases where they were going outside. And then when you do this uh, and you sum everything together, this is the picture on the right, which you're going to get. The reality, unfortunately, is much more complex. And uh, I wouldn't be able to go into too much detail of how this reality is coming, but I can show you at least where the problems come from. 
Uh, so you see our detectors are not as fast. They can't really record the oscillations of all the fields uh, at the time scales, which are here much, much, much faster than 10 seconds. What we can do though, is we can measure how much energy goes up because X-rays we can absorb, uh, then depending on the absorption, we can count how many of those X-rays have counted. Uh, so we have a very good idea of how much intensity is going in each direction. So for instance, here, there can be a lot of intensity, here gonna be no intensity. The thing which we're losing there is this phase. And phase is uh, basically, uh, if you look at the circle, the phase is gonna be uh, telling you which, which phase of the wave uh, you arrive at the circle. You can arrive at the, this, you know, at the maxima of the circle, like for instance, uh, roughly here. So you see this is a top of the wave arriving in the circle at a certain time, or you can get with the minima, or you can get anywhere in between. And this is this phase information, which is uh, lost. And then the whole hundred years of crystallography development was basically about how do you deal with this lost phase, how you recover. So uh, being quite complex in terms of the analysis, this method is quite good uh, in, in experimental terms. Because uh, now that you uh, have your uh, molecule, you can in principle increase the amount of signal. And then the way you increase the signal is you put more molecules together. And then here, since we're looking at the diffraction, we don't have to align molecules one after the other. We can use, first of all, all three dimensions uh, in order to stack them. So we can stack them along X, Y, and Z. And then if we put them uh, in the right places, they all gonna be interfering together and the interference gonna be becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. And second of all, actually uh, this scheme is much more robust against misalignment of some of the molecules. If you know the first 1000 molecules go here and the other 1000 molecules are shifted by, you know, uh, by just a little bit, by uh, half of the molecule direction, the overall uh, intensity distribution not gonna be changing. You're gonna lose a little bit of the photons but you're gonna be uh, keeping the overall intense distribution. So in principle, this grows quite nicely. And the third beauty about this thing is actually there is a way how we can arrange molecules in this nice periodic patterns. And in fact, this is done for us by nature. Uh, last thing why this scheme is actually very, very remarkable and very useful is uh, the property of diffraction by uh, arrangements of things which are periodic. So here I'm showing the uh, diffraction by laser, uh, but here inside uh, the laser, you'll have a periodic grating. So something which changes the uh, laser contrast uh, in a very regular fashion. So exactly the same as our, you know, hypothetical molecules stuck together. What it does then is by introducing a single ray of light in there, the scattering gonna be not structureless, as I've shown you on the top picture, they're gonna be very structured. They're gonna be focused in a set of very sharp peaks. Uh, and then uh, those are quite easy to you know, identify and distinguish from the background. So this even provides an extra ability for us to get data at very good quality. Now, the beauty of all this is that there is a way to get molecules or uh, even such complicated things as ribosomes arranged in a periodic fashion. And that's by growing crystals out of these. You all seen crystals, I'm pretty sure. Uh, the most popular are uh, something like a quartz crystals. There's a rose quartz uh, you see on the picture on the left. Uh, well, lots of minerals which come in the crystal form. So on the right, I've shown titanite, which I like particularly. And the reason why they are looking so nicely is just because they are arranged exactly the right way that we want. So uh, for instance, quartz crystals, they're made out of the tetrahedral of silicon oxide and the silicon oxide arranged in the six cycle fashion. And then uh, this periodicity is actually very nice. It's, it's going on for a very long time uh, and it's uh, unperturbed and then it's such that it provides us with very strong signal uh, in the set of very sharp peaks. Titanite structure is much more complex. It contains oxides of calcium, titanium, and silicon. Uh, but if you look at that, uh, you'll again see that there is a particular block, uh, which is called a unit cell, which if you then repeat multiple times in three directions, you're gonna build the full uh, range of titanite crystals. 
In fact, I'm pretty sure you're aware of other crystals. For instance, there are lots of crystals on your kitchen. Can you name any of those? Oh, sugar. sugar, salt, yes. Anything else? Ice, yeah, that's pretty good. Yes. Any else? Sodium hydrogen carbonate. Sodium hydrogen carbonate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've I've prepared several of these. Uh, so the one which is the most obvious are salt and sugar. They come in these nice crystalline forms, and sometimes you can even get these candies of sugar, very huge cubes. Vanillin is another one which you might find, or citric acid comes uh, in this form. Uh, soda, obviously, uh, obviously in crystal form, though those are smaller. And baking powder, and in fact, baking powder contains uh, another material. There is not just soda in there, so it's a separate set of things. Uh, ice, which grows on your freezer, uh, does grow in form of crystals. Uh, if it's given enough time, you know, in the atmosphere or in a special setup like here in the picture, uh, this uh, ice forms this beautiful, nice hexagonal snowflakes or beautiful hexagonal crystal forms. Uh, that's another example of crystals. Do you know any other materials which can be crystalline? Not necessarily, you know, quite obviously crystalline, but going to contain crystals in them. Obsidian. Obsidian. Yes. Uh, it, it can be then uh, there is a black form of it that's not completely transparent. I have a transparent. Unfortunately, I can't say yes or no because I have no clue. <laughs> but uh, that, that sounds very plausible, yes. Um, another interesting example would be steel all the metals around you, if you look at them, you wouldn't see much of the crystals of them, except for anodized metals. So, you know, somewhere uh, on the post lamps, uh, they're going to be this shape of different, uh, you know, of different shininess of metal. There's going to be the crystals uh, of the anodized zinc uh, on, the, on the material. Uh, but if you look inside uh, metal, uh, you will see that it's made out of tiny crystallites uh, of, uh, well, you know, steel, iron. Uh, and uh, in fact, there is a lot of science on how to produce metal so that the crystallites, in that particular case, going to be present but small. Uh, that makes the steel the, the, most, uh, the best uh, properties. You have quite a lot of crystals in your smartphones uh, because uh, a lot of electronics is built on top of silicon single crystals. So that's uh, going to be the crystals uh, around you. And uh, what else? Uh, yeah, so this is going to be the ones. Anyways, uh, I wonder if I have something, something else. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, if you start looking at these things, and if you have a particular task of growing a crystal, which you would do, because now you know that crystals uh, is something which helps you understand what the structure of the material is that you're looking at, it, it turns out that uh, a lot of things would like to grow as crystals. And this, uh, and there's a hint of how you do this, uh, probably best seen in sugar or vanillin, uh, is when you try to make the material and make the material very, very clean and allow it to settle together then it will actually naturally try to form a crystal. So for instance, uh, snowflakes or snow, like ice uh, in, in the freezer, uh, it, 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 it's made out of water and then it's settled together. But I think even sugar is going to be a better example because when you produce sugar, uh, there are going to be a lot of different sugars that you start with. But uh, the way you extract saccharose is by uh, dissolving everything in water and then by then letting the water evaporate. And then you'll see that as you do this, uh, the saccharose molecule is going to start to stick together and then they're naturally going to be forming uh, the crystals like this. Or the vanillin is another example here grown in a more uh, elaborate way. 
In fact, the same trick works for even more complex examples. So this is a, an example of crystal of the lysozyme growing in a tiny drop. Uh, lysozyme is a protein uh, which, for instance, is uh, found in, in, in tears of humans, uh, which protects, which has a little bit of antiseptic uh, properties. And then if you, in this particular case, it's dissolved in water or with salt and buffer, but if you allow it to crystallize by now introducing another solvent, which kind of salts the crystal out, you will see that uh, as we start, then the crystals are going to start forming. And then as the time goes, the crystals are going to be naturally growing by themselves. So, and this is uh, one of the reasons why uh, we find a lot of uh, beautiful crystals in nature. Nature is very uh, patient. Uh, it allows crystals to grow for a very long time. Uh, and then there are sometimes conditions where some things can be dissolved in water in hydrothermal way of making crystals. And then, uh, you know, those salts can be coming together and deposit a very, very long time in certain places. And sometimes this produces enormous crystals. So the biggest crystal is going to be better, bigger than human in some of the caves. Uh, all right. Um, well, really, the whole idea of uh, trying to use crystals in order to determine structure got kicked off uh, in 1912 uh, with Max von Laue uh, when he was making his uh, famous discovery. Uh, at that time, he was uh, working in Munich. And then uh, for the discovery he made in 1912, uh, he got a Nobel Prize already in 1914 because it was very obvious very early on that this is a very fundamental work. So what he did is that he took a, an X-ray tube uh, and then his idea was that X-rays are, in fact, waves. At that time, it wasn't particularly clear if that's indeed the case. There was a lot of radioactivity going on, and there might have been particles. And he, uh, and there was another debate which was kind of subtle, but not quite, was that, uh, you know, the crystals are made in exactly the same ways I've shown to you, that they are made out of the periodic repeat of certain uh, atomic arrangements. It's not that people didn't trust that at that stage chemistry was very well developed, but there were some physicists who said, well, you know, we've never seen atoms. So how, how do we need to believe in atoms? There are multiple other ways how you can make models for matter, which don't uh, imply, you know, individual discrete uh, units of matter in the form of atoms. And there was one simple experiment, and this is the setup which uh, you can find in the Deutsches Museum uh, in Munich, uh, which is still used by von Laue. He started with the X-ray tube, and then on the other side, he put a little crystal of uh, uh, sulfite, uh, and then uh, the X-rays were going to the crystal and back again, and then uh, at the back scattering, he would have seen this uh, picture, which contained uh, a set of spots. It looks like a terrible picture these days, but this uh, one individual experiment has proven two things all at the same time. So it was proven that, first of all, X-rays are indeed waves because they are periodic, since they can scatter back in this diffracted form, they must be waves. Second uh, is that the crystal is indeed made out of periodic arrangement of some individual scatters, atoms. And then the third is that the wavelength of X-rays and wavelength of the atoms, uh, the size of the atoms are roughly the, the, the right scale to each other. So that's, that the two things can uh, interact with each other. So one shot, uh, two important achievements. Uh, the progress came very, very quickly after that, because already in 1914, uh, this two gentlemen, so, uh, so Henry Berg and Lawrence Berg, uh, his son, they realized that by looking at not only the positions of these break peaks, but also the intensity distribution of these break peaks, they can sort uh, the uh, arrangement of atoms in there. And they started with this, the simplest example of sodium chloride, which is a very uh, simple structure containing sodium and chlorine uh, in this checkerboard interchanging uh, fashion. Uh, and then they've sold a couple of other ones which are similar. And then they, they saw that there's certain uh, uh, variability in the, the size of the unit cells. And uh, this was uh, really the, the very birth of the structural chemistry. So out of this, you could really start understanding you know, what are the scales of things and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, as the time progressed, uh, the structures uh, which people were able to solve uh, would become more and more complex. And uh, uh, already in 50s and 60s, the crystallography was powerful enough to uh, help chemists. For instance, there was uh, a particular problem in trying to get a synthetic version of penicillin, which was the first and the most important uh, antibiotic. 
a certain time, and then it was clear how to produce penicillin from uh, the cultures. But when you produce it from cultures, you are still, uh, you know, unsure. Sometimes cultures grow, sometimes the cultures don't grow, and uh, it doesn't provide, you know, very continuous and reliable uh, stock for that. If you're a good chemist, you can try to synthesize the molecule, but in order to synthesize the molecule, you need to know how it looks like. And penicillin isn't a very straightforward molecule, as you'll see on the right here. So there are some units which are pretty involved, like the square ring over there. Uh, and it was indeed important to solve it. Uh, this was quite a large molecule at the time, crystallography could handle it. And Dorothy Hodgkin was the person who did solve it uh, and won a Nobel Prize for that, 1964. Uh, and then at that stage, she already was using some of the computers developed by Alan Turing. Fast forward to modern days. Uh, this is still a very, very popular and you know, beloved by chemists technique in order to understand what they have synthesized. In fact, every department of chemistry uh, where you have organic chemistry, where people making new organic molecules would always have a machine which was looking roughly like this. So this is a diffractometer. Uh, we'll have, uh, I think our department has a couple of those uh, in chemistry. In our material science, we have two we get uh, of those as well. So they're quite nice, optimized, efficient. Uh, they can now solve structures uh, as a matter of hours. So it actually takes chemists much longer to prepare the material uh, to start with uh, and to put it in a crystalline form, just because these days they're caring about bigger and bigger molecules, uh, they, uh, which crystallize less and less nicely. Uh, and if you see this, this is a relatively small machine, I think uh, roughly this size, like a the size of a table. Uh, and if you look in there, the place for the sample is, is really, you know, like right there in the middle, where uh, I'll just show you what are the things. So from the left comes the x-rays. So this is uh, the machine which has two wavelengths. It's either 1.5 angstrom long uh, from the copper target or 0 0.7 from a molybdenum target, they, you can choose between those two. In the middle, you'll have your sample mounted uh, on a pin. Uh, and then unfortunately, you don't see a crystal here because the crystal is tiny. Uh, then there are lots of other things. You'll have a big detector. These days it's quite large detectors. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, the focus, this is going to be the stop as a beam stop so that the primary beam doesn't hit the detector directly because they're very sensitive. They wouldn't like it that much. And also we're going to be changing the temperature. Uh, organic molecules are not always stable. If you cool them down, uh, they're going to be more stable. Uh, and then we usually use uh, the flow of the cold nitrogen coming through here, you know, to get them to around 100 Kelvin, put them here. And then the whole machine down there, that's called a goniometer. That's basically a precise motion stage, which allows to rotate the crystal from a direction so that you can get the diffraction from every possible direction here. The crystals we're looking at are really, really tiny. So here are some examples of protein crystals people are looking at. Uh, and then you see, this is the needle uh, we're gonna be looking at. There is a little bit of plastic on top of that, which you probably can't see on the screen. Uh, if I can come to uh, my screen, I, I see just a hint of it, just because I know what to look for. Uh, and then on top of that piece of plastic, uh, they're gonna be a little hole. Uh, so it's a little, like a little spoon which holds the crystal. And here you see the micrograph of uh, some protein crystals in a 75 micron uh, loop. So again, roughly, we're now talking about the crystals, which if you start rolling between your fingers, you can kind of feel there's something there, but maybe not. Uh, and then they are more than sufficient these days in order to be uh, you know, used to solve their structure. The detector is going to be a large detector, and it's going to contain, again, a set of these peaks. Uh, they're called after the Bragg's, uh, the Bragg peaks, uh, and then uh, everything is very nicely automated. So if you're solving a molecular structure uh, in the old days, uh, you might take you know several months uh, in order to find uh, the right structure. And today uh, it takes maybe less than uh, making a cup of coffee uh, in order to you know put the crystal together, collect every, every, everything, and analyze the data, and then uh, it provides you with nice arrangements of the atoms. If you're interested to try to repeat this, in fact, I found that uh, you can see some of the diffraction, which works in exactly the same way as the crystallography works. And in fact, you've seen this already multiple times, probably not have noticed there. And that's uh, right on your phones. 
if you'll uh, put them such that uh, there is some bright source of light in one particular place, if you look very carefully, you will see this pattern in here. So you see, you start with a bright source of light, which gives you a ray of light incoming from that direction. But then as it shines on your phone, that splits uh, into multiple different reflections. This is again diffraction, and it's caused by the fact that uh, your phone is a crystal in a sense. So your phone is made out of individual pixels, and these pixels are arranged in very perfect regular uh, grid. And uh, since they're quite small and they're roughly the same, the same size as the wavelength uh, uh, of, of the incoming light, you will see a very good pattern of diffraction. So we are now almost at the diffraction limit of the pixels uh, as well as, uh, so that uh, these this patterns are quite nicely visible. In fact, uh, if you read uh, through this uh, link, I mean, I can share it somewhere uh, where you'll be able to find it. Uh, there is some discussion of how you can learn something about the pattern of pixels in there, because depending on technology, this might be either very regular rectangular pixels or some diamond pixels around there. And everybody just looking by the uh, shape of what is the scattering in here, then it, you might uh, be able to learn it. Things are going to get better if you can get a single individual wavelength. So if you take a laser pointer and then try to make a, a diffraction experiment like this, by you know holding the phone, uh, shining it with the uh, individual wavelength in some way, and then uh, checking what you have uh, in the reflection, you will see that uh, the peak is going to be coming uh, much more clean. And in fact, by just a couple of measurements, uh, you'll be also able to even check what's the size of the pixel of these things. So there is some you know some some kickoff. Uh, on that is here. The other place which you might have seen, but this is coming out of fashion so quickly that I'm afraid you might have not known what are these things. So that's in the upper right corner. This is called a CD disk. This is an ancient way of storing information uh, people were using. In my age, it was hard. So it uh, contains 667 megabytes of data on this optical device, and you can put it in your computer and read it. Because you used to be able to do this. Uh, nowadays, it doesn't work as easily as that. But that is, in a sense, also a crystal. So not a very good one, not a very regular one. That it doesn't make your, uh, you know, data flow in all the three dimensions periodically. But uh, along uh, the disk, there are tracks, and the tracks are very, very regular. And those tracks contain, you know, either ones, on ones or zeros. And then the space in between the tracks is very regular. So if you'll, again, uh, take a look at this, uh, either on the bright source, uh, you will see, or, or by looking at the laser points, you'll see that uh, if you shine on this, uh, they're going to be certain diffracted spots. And this diffraction uh, is exactly the same way as we measure atomic structure. Uh, in our material. I think I'm running out of time and then that's uh, all the slides that I've prepared. So there, I hope there's a lot of time for questions. You have those questions and I'm going to be happy to answer those 